Aboriginal people of the Eora Nation and their elders past and present. I am a Torres Strait Islander, as Rob said, a proud Torres Strait Islander. I've got my Torres Strait Islander shirt on here. We were headhunters once upon a time, and uh, so I don't get smart, all right? Just do things. All right, um, so <laughs> I, um, I am conscious that, um, you know, I also want to pay my respects to all new comrades, you know, that have come here to listen to this, and I'm conscious that uh, some of you have, have heard me speak and would have heard uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight, um, but, you know, it helps to, to really let it sink in, eh? So we'll go through it some things again, uh, but there's some people that may not have heard a lot about this. What we're talking about is the honorary statement from the heart. Um, it's a wonderful, um, given that I'm talking to activists, um, I must say up front, this is a wonderful campaigning opportunity. Um, you know, this, this beautiful document, which is a canvas that's about that high and as wide as my arm span, um, is really something to behold in person. I travelled around the country with it for around 18 months. Uh, taking it to communities such as, um, you know, at Yule River Bush Meeting in the Pilbara, where um, the Pilbara tribes have been meeting for thousands of years and still do um, annually at the moment, um, today. Um, to the Gurindji country, one of the first, well, the first place I took it after I collected it in Darwin, after it was first publicly revealed at the Gama Festival um, on the land of the Yolngu people, the Gumach clan. Um, was to um, Kalkarinji and Dagaragu uh, and it was uh, endorsed with a wonderful um, statement from the Gurindji elders and basically they said that um, that uh, they joined their voices with the voices of the Yolmu people and Galaroi Yunapingu who had um, spoken about it uh, just a week before um, and, uh, and uh, the voices of those that um, endorsed this at Uluru. I'll talk a little bit more about the, the statement and, and the artwork soon. But this time I want to start, and uh, those that have done the um, ACTU uh, Voice Treaty Truth course would have, uh, would have already uh, seen some of these slides. Um, you might want to take note now if you're a union member. Um, there is a course that the ACTU runs through the ATUI um, that uh, it's two three-hour sessions over two days, um, and uh, I take uh, it's to teach people about this campaign. So you're going to get a bit of a crash course in it. Before this moment, this one here, 1901, and the formation of the Constitution, the becoming of Australia, and even further back, I think it's always important when we talk about. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about the history of the struggle. It's always important to acknowledge that before um, Captain Cook came. And told his lies about Terra Nullius, that we were that this land was vacant, um, that we didn't exist. Um, we had a wonderful um, and peaceful society, civilization. And I, I, I expressed peaceful in the way that I did, because this is something that is the truth, something that experts are finding more and more um, are, are saying these days that the way that they um, find this is they talk about the languages, First Nations languages. And if you've seen the I-axis map and the hundreds of First Nations, all those language groups and how they evolved um, with such uh, unique languages, so different from each other in one continent in such close proximity, there had to have been an incredibly advanced societal structure. There had to be peace. We weren't conquering people like in Europe. We were a peaceful people. We were the masters of dispute resolution. And one of the things that the Uluru Statement talks about is the Makarata Commission. Makarata being the Yolnu word for the coming together after a struggle. It's the Yolnu's people's uh, form of dispute resolution, which exists for all First Nations in different names um, across the country, across the continent and adjacent islands. So, you know, and when you visit places, um, when you go to um, see the pristine environment um, where it has managed to be maintained, and it has been maintained mostly by the struggle of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people fighting for the rights of themselves in their land. 
take a moment to, to pause and really think about what we destroyed, what, what the Europeans destroyed when they came here and invaded soon after Captain Cook. The abundance of the country, the beauty of the country, that peaceful society that they tore the fabric apart. And we are rebuilding. So, there was a whole lot of genocide, um, blatant massacres, poisonings, all those things. And then in 1901, after constitutional con uh, discussions, constitutional dialogues, the colonies that became the states in this new federation um, became. Now the constitution, I describe it simply as a rule book. The rules, the constitution was agreed between those colonies about how they would share power um, and how and how basically uh, we would function as a country. A couple of points that I really want to point out to you to, to take note of is section 5126, firstly, the race power. And a lot of Australians are unaware that there's a race power in the Constitution. They're so unaware that in opposition to our campaign, one of the things that those dogs at the IPA are using to try and um, deter Australians from supporting this campaign is they say that if you introduce a voice um, into the Constitution for a, a set of people, First Nations people, that is introducing race into our Constitution that we don't want. We don't want to have a racist Constitution. There's equality. The blackfellas have a vote. But what most Australians are unaware of is that there is, this Constitution is already racist. There's a race power. In 1901, the race power existed without, to the exclusion of Aboriginal, um, Aboriginal people. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit more later, because that was changed in 1967. In, nine, in section 127, um, the other part that I want you to be aware of is that we were excluded from being counted in the census, so being counted as Australian citizens. This here, this is a wharfie. His name is Fred Maynard. Um, you may, might know of a historian at Newcastle University, John Maynard. He's written a great book, if you want to note it, um, called A Fight for Liberty and Freedom, about these times. So in the 1920s, Fred Maynard and others started the Aboriginal Progressive uh, Association, Australian Association, 1924. Um, this is recognised as the first all Aboriginal political organisation. And it began the fight for constitutional recognition, it began the fight for equal citizenship rights, and it began the fight for that um, Section 51 to be changed. They wanted the federal government to take power over Indigenous affairs because the states were so cruel, the state governments were so cruel. By 1928 this disappeared, this organisation. It disappeared from the public eye because the authorities, um, the protection board, um, the police, they intimidated Fred and the other leaders, the other participants of this organisation, um, threatened to steal their children, all those things that they could do totally legally. And I know you guys know this, but I'll just quickly say, they could enslave us, they could direct us to work without pay, they stole our wages, they stole our children, um, just so much injustice legal injustice. Uh, this here, um, just quickly, this is on the water side as well. This is a bunch of African American and indigenous uh, water side workers. Um, Jack Johnson, the, the um, world champion African American boxer, um, was in Australia and showed solidarity with us. Um, and so that was the NBA, APA. So, that organisation, the AAPA, mentored some wonderful leaders that went on to the 1930s. Um, William Cooper is one of them. William Cooper um, uh, took a petition uh, around the joint to, again, fighting for those same things. For a voice, for political representation, um, you know, for the federal government to take control of Indigenous affairs, uh, among other things. Self-determination. The Day of Mourning, 1938. Um, William Cooper was one of those um, important leaders then, Jack Patton. Uh, very brave. 
extremely brave. It's actually not far from here, Elizabeth Street, Australia House. You might walk past it and have no idea that this, um, this one of the first, uh, actually it's, it's heritage listed because of the significance of that protest. Um, they were so brave because they were treated as less than human, yet they turned up. And they fought against the 26th of January, right? It was a protest against the celebration of the invasion of our land. Uh, so that, uh, you know, we've been fighting against 26 January as a celebration for a long time. That petition was to the king, the, the, the king of England. I can't remember his name. Um, but anyway, it never made it to the king. The Victorian Parliament dismissed the petition. It, uh, it never made it. Uh, you'll see a pattern start to emerge here. Um, the 19... Next I'll go to the 1970, uh, 1963 Likala Bark Petitions. A fight for, by the Yolmu people that I mentioned earlier against the Kamalko mine and the government excising that huge amount of their country for that mine. That mine was... Um, that uh, land was reserved for the um, Yolmu people. There was a huge reserve there. Because the government at that time thought that, you know, out of sight, out of mind, um, that country is useless to us, but of course mining interests change that. The only people put together this petition, the beginning of a tradition with the artwork, that, um, that's not just artwork, it's like our own constitution. It's saying this is our law, um, along with the, um, the English version of a petition. Um, a couple of MPs, uh, Kim Beasley uh, Senior was one of them, travelled to Yakala to hear from the petitioners. Uh, and um, there was a, 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 a parliamentary committee established. Um, the Akala bark, bark Petition not only calls for the protection of their lands, it called for a voice, it called for an interface with the, with the Commonwealth about the things that uh, the interests of the people. I come from um, Larrakia land and one of the things it said was that, um, and not verbatim, but we the petitioners fear um, that we will be ignored as we have been ignored before and the fate of the Larrakia tribe um, will be our fate as well. They saw what happened where a city was built and how it decimated the Larrakia people, who still survive and thrive today though. The, um, the parliamentary committee that was formed recommended that this voice be established, this, this interface, among other things. But the parliament ignored it and just excised. So another petition ignored, even the recommendation of a parliamentary committee ignored, and um, a whole lot of sacred sites and country has been lost to that mine. They took it to the Supreme Court and lost. The Northern Territory Supreme Court, but it set some precedent. This work that the Yonu people did, their struggle, set precedent for the Mabo case um, decades later. There was, some, uh, there was actually some acknowledgement of the societal structure in that, um, in that decision, uh, but ultimately was overturned. Um, 1972, back to Larrakia country. You can see this long um, patched together petition, the thumb marks from the people, the illiterate people that signed it. Um, this one to the Queen, ignored. Never made it to the Queen. Um, another petition ignored. Jump to 1988. Actually, I should go back a step. 1967 was the culmination of a struggle from the 1920s and no doubt before. Um, that our elders had fought to be recognised as Australian citizens, to be counted as Australian citizens, um, and uh, to see that the federal government took control of Indigenous affairs. So we must recognise that as a success, but we also should um, be aware of how long it takes for change to happen um, and how hard we need to fight. The Barunga Statement was 1988. You can see the Prime Minister of the time, Bob Hawke, with Mr. Yunapindu there, um, on country. And the Barunga Statement, this time, uh, called for a treaty, called for a national system of land rights. It called, and this is the thing to note here when we're talking about the Uluru Statement, it called on the Commonwealth Parliament to pass laws providing a national elected Aboriginal and Islander organisation to oversee Aboriginal and Islander affairs, and a national, yeah, that one. Now, Bob Hawke, um, as his last act as Prime Minister, you might recall, hung the Barunga Statement 
up in the um, hung it up in the uh, in the parliament and uh, was crying, you know, tears of uh, lamenting that he wasn't able to deliver it on his promise of treaty. He failed. But Hawke did deliver on the voice. He established APSIC. And he established APSIC with the vehement opposition of John Howard, who was the opposition leader at the time. So APSIC was established, this national elected Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, organisation, to speak for us, basically. The, um, what happened then was when uh, John Howard came into power, he immediately went after APSIC, he went about destroying it. Now I'll just jump to something that's a lot more familiar to us as unionists here. I was 21 years old in 1998 on the, on the wharves in Darwin. And uh, unforgettable for anyone that was a unionist of the time was how John Howard colluded with Chris Corrigan, um, and the National Farmers Federation to physically drag us out of our livelihoods. But I want you to think about what happened before that. I remember as a young bloke wondering, and I, and I don't have a union background or an activist background, right? And this was a huge lesson for me about unionism and collectivism. Um, but I was wondering, hang on, we do work hard on the wall. There's problems with management, there's problems with bottlenecks, there's problems with machinery. Um, but they were telling us, they were telling the country that we were lazy, constantly in Parliament. The media was backing it up. And I was wondering as a young man, you know, what is this? It was John Howard softening up the public to do that awful act that he did in 1998. There was a strategy behind it. Did the same thing to ATSIC. ATSIC was bashed from pillar to post. You know, our, our leaders were demonised. The organisation was just, um, you know, it just really undermined it. There was a review done by Aunty Jackie Huggins from Queensland that never saw the light of day that, that was going to see ATSIC improve, like all human organisations do, should do. You know, our unions have to, our, our constitutions need to evolve with the needs of our members, um, as, do, um, as should ours, our, our constitutions. Um, and so he destroyed it uh, in 2005 um, far too easily with barely a whimper. So in the absence of ATSIC, within, in the absence of a structured voice, what did we see? The intervention, hundreds of millions of dollars cut from community services, you know, some of the most hideous acts, it took us back decades. Um, and that is something really important to consider when we're talking about why the Uluru Statement calls for a voice. It's not to say that we don't have a voice at all. You know, we march on the streets, as unions do when we're pissed off with the government, when we're fighting against the omnibus bill, for example, the next attack on workers, on workers' rights. But is that voice effective? The way that we do it now? I love a rally, don't get me wrong, love an occupation, love shaking my fist at them and causing a disruption, but you know what, it's not changing anything in, indigenous, in, in our space, it's not changing enough, it's not quick enough when there are people dying. So activists, people that think about these things, people that care, need to be honest with themselves and think about how we do things better. One example is, think about the Black Lives Matter opportunity that we had. March, what was it, last year. Um, George Floyd, the treatment of, um, you know, the, the murder of George Floyd. And then you think about what happens here. You know, Dave, David Dungay Jr. On film, uh, crying that he, he could not breathe. And still no justice. No justice for David, no justice for that family. We turned out around the country probably more people than we had in a long time in March. I think the estimate was a million people hit the streets around Black Lives Matter in Australia. And here we were highlighting these issues of deaths in custody mostly. Did that hold any of those decision makers to account? No. 
Did we continue those protests as we should have? Did we increase momentum? No. It's the pattern that I have seen over and over again. We've got to do better. All right. This one here, Kirribilli statement and the R that you see there. This was in 2015. And in the, the crisis that we had of intervention, of millions of dollars being cut from in, um, Indigenous services and all the rest, in the absence of a voice, there was a meeting at Kirribilli to say, something's got to change. There was a campaign that had gone on for 10 years before that, but the problem with that was it hadn't asked First Nations people beforehand how we wanted to be recognised. It was important to raise awareness that there was a lack of constitutional recognition and this is something that we needed to do. Um, but what was said here was that we don't support symbolic recognition, constitutional change. We want substantive constitutional change. And so that is what set path. The other thing that it called for was the resources to go to our communities and find out what it is that we want in regards to constitutional recognition. And so the Uluru Statement process happened, the Referendum Council ran it, you can see here where the dialogues were held, the outcomes, the voice of Parliament was the most strongly supported um, reform, agreement making or treaty making, and I, I should note here that the Indigenous members of the Referendum Council had to fight tooth and nail to get this column here, to get this as one of the things that we were going to discuss, because they knew that people wanted to talk about treaty. It's called agreement making, not because we're avoiding the word treaty, it's because there are many various types of agreements that First Nations are doing around the country. It's not just treaties. Statement of acknowledgement, the symbolic constitutional recognition was the least supported, as you can see here. There were ten guiding principles decided at the beginning of the Uluru Convention, which was the culmination of these dialogues where delegates went to. And it means what we what guides us is that the reforms do not diminish First Nations sovereignty, that it involves substantive structural reform, that it advances self-determination and the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, that it recognises the status and rights of First Nations, tells the truth of Australia's history, does not foreclose on any further future advancement, does not waste the opportunity for reform, provides a mechanism for First Nations agreement making and has the support of First Nations and does not interfere with the position um, of existing legal arrangements. So these were the guiding principles and they guide us today. All right. This was soon after the three-day, um, at the end of the three-day convention, when the Uluru Statement from the Heart was read for the very first time. This is a photo of all of the brothers and sisters and uncles and aunties. Um, the wonderful moment when we endorsed it. And I'm going to, um, I know some of you heard me do it, but I'm going to recite your statement just so that you might feel what we felt um, at that, that morning. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands, and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did, according to the reckoning of our culture, from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom, remain attached there too, and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished, and it coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise? That a people's possess the land for 60 millennia, and this sacred link disappears from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. 
These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional change to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our own destiny, our children will flourish, they will walk in two worlds, and our culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarada is a culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarada Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967 we were counted, in 2017 we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. I see what you're So, soon after that moment, we lined up this blank canvas. There was a blank canvas then. Uh, pencil marks can still be seen there. Of course, we'd only just endorse a statement. Um, and so we all put our names around here. Then um, the uh, Reedy Pulitzer, uh, Christine Brumby, Happy Reed, and Charmaine Pulitzer um, each come from the four different song lines that are depicted on here. Um, Anugu and All Woman uh, painted this, and it was ready by August in time for the Ghana Festival. Um, it was the first time I saw it. Um, now I'm going to cut to. Uh, Firstly, just briefly on why it's important. Voice, treaty, truth are the things that it calls for, right? Constitutionally enshrined voice in a Makarata Commission to supervise the process of agreement making and uh, truth telling. Really important. Um, Makarata Commission, you might think of as sort of like a fair, better than a Fair Work Commission, hopefully, but um, a place where you can go at a point of impasse, you know, because there's a, there's a huge power. Um, if you think about the power dynamic, of First Nations doing a treaty with well-established, well-resourced um, uh, state governments is how it's happening at the moment. Um, you need to have that, that layer of um, you know, something like a commission to, um, to, to bring the, the parties together and make sure that there's uh, fair bargaining or fair negotiation. Um, the other thing about truth-telling is truth-telling is ongoing. So, you know, you, you need to, it's good to have some coordination. Um, but the voice is where the battleground is. So the government's ignored the Makarata Commission, and that's something that could be legislated any time. But the battleground is about constitutional change. That's where the power is. The Constitution, as I said earlier, is a rule book. Remember Section 44. Politicians losing their job because they didn't comply with the, with the Constitution. If there is a First Nations voice representative body enshrined in the Constitution, and the Constitution says that it must be heard. That is far greater power than we have right now. Voices on the streets, voices behind closed doors with a conga line of our leaders having meetings in private with um, ministers and top bureaucrats, that is not working for us. It's not transparent. And here's something that the government has tried to say. They're trying to make it a voice to government at one stage. Was, they changed the language to voice to government instead of voice to parliament. A voice to government is status quo. A voice to government is us shaking our fist at the government from the street. It's those knocking on doors and having meetings in private. A voice to parliament is much different. It is transparent on hand side to the, those that are in power and the opposition and the crossbenchers. Transparent not just to the Australian people to hold politicians to account, but also transparent to our own people so we know what our leaders are saying about what's important to us. Really important point. So, I want to, I've probably taken too long here, so I want to jump to what you can do now. Where are we right now? The government has always dismissed this. From October 2017, officially, um, Turnbull dismissed it. They say in the union movement, don't we comrades, that we should celebrate our wins. Well, we didn't take no for an answer. Right? There's a little slide here. Some of the... We didn't take no for an answer. You know, we had some of these actions, some of you comrades were involved. 
This here is uh, in Turnbull's electorate at the time. In uh, King's Cross there, we rocked up and we made trouble and we went and um, talked to people on the street and throughout the market. Um, you know, really uh, those sorts of actions. This is the Torres Strait, one of the greatest moments in my life, leading this procession of thousands of Torres Strait Islanders uh, for the Windsor Zenith Cultural Festival um, and the Uluru Statement had private place there. The Pilbara country there that I was talking about, Hill River. Um, we haven't taken no for an answer. And we've moved it from complete dismissal to where the government established in 2018 a Joint Select Committee. That Joint Select Committee, through our activism, recommended that the voice was the most strongly desired thing from both um, wider Australia and First Nations people, consistent with what happened at Uluru, consistent with what polling we've done, and have been forced by our activism now to have a voice co-design process. And of course, what are the Liberals trying to do? They're trying to bastardise that, yeah? So, this opportunity that we have right now, since late January, there has been a public consultation process open. It's a very short process. 31st of March is when it cuts off. In the Northern Territory, I'm fighting um, and trying to get the NT government and the Commonwealth to put some resources into bringing mob out from community into Darwin, Catherine, Alice Springs to have some information about this 243 page report that these consultations are based on. To be able to make submissions in an informed way. Um, but the opportunity is for us to make submissions. Unions, all organisations, individuals, we want to build a narrative that says that even though the Liberals have said that it's not on the terms of reference for this co-design process, to talk about the constitutional form that this takes, we demand that it's on the record that we understand that this model, this voice, must be underpinned, protected and empowered by the Constitution. That is the action that we must take now. So with that, um, I want to make sure people have time to ask questions. I'll just say that the website, there are two websites that have guidance to make submissions, fromtheheart.com.au and ururustatement.org. Like any big campaign, there's different groups that are working uh, you know, um, alongside each other basically, but in different ways. Um, so either of those, the message is the same on both of them, um, as in the guidance to make submissions. So please go to those websites and not only make your own submission, but organise for others to do so too. Thank you. So uh, the question was, as far as uh, referendums go, without bipartisan support, uh, it's, it's going to be, you, you don't think it'll be successful. Um, I agree that historically, um, bipartisan support has, uh, you know, I thought it was 8 out of 44 have been successful, but, um, yeah. yeah. But they've all had bipartisan support to succeed, right? Um, I, I think that we can do it without bipartisan support. Um, I think, you know, it's been a long time since we've had a referendum. 1999 was the last one, yeah? Um, and that wasn't really supported by the Prime Minister either, he bastardised it. But, um, but I think that it's different times, we're in the age of social media, there's record low levels of trust um, for political figures. Um, and I think with leadership, 
we can win it. Another thing that informs that that informs my thinking there is 1967 and just that overwhelming result in support. There's been 20 years of reconciliation talks and truth telling for a lot longer than that. Um, the polling, uh, you know, and you can't rely on polling. I understand that, but um, the, the Reconciliation Australia barometer shows um, more than 88 percent, I think it is, of Australians are ready to vote yes for this specifically. Um, and so I think we can win. I think if we were to wait for the Conservatives as they are today, because they're so right-wing, right? They're so influenced by some really disgusting people. Um, then we would never move forward. I mentioned, I mentioned the, the constitution and how constitutions of organisations, representative bodies, countries need to evolve. So does ours, right? So does ours. And the past, if, if, if this constitution is frozen in time, because so few have been successful and it hasn't been, you know, none have been for a long time, um, then that's a freaking terrible place for us to be as First Nations people, you know. So I think we have to have the courage to pursue it. I think um, other countries do it much better than us. They probably don't have as high a bar, um, double majority. But um, I know other countries, for things like abortion laws, they, they hold referendum over and over until the country gets it right. <laughs> right? They say, you know, hang on. You know, yeah. Possibly, but then it's up to our activism to push for it to be held again, you know? I think it'll be close if we, you know, do lose, but I don't think we will. Your other question, um, mate, just to respond to the other question was, um, what will the amendment look like, basically? Um, firstly, uh, yeah, so there are various constitutional experts, including Indigenous constitutional expert like Professor Megan Davis, that have worked on options for this. There is no decided um, question for the referendum. There's no decided even design of the voice. As I said, we're going through a process now. So if anyone says this is weak, you know, then they're talking out of school, you know, or out of, um, out of sequence, because there's, there's no decision. Um, but as far as the amendment goes, here's one possibility. Section 129, the First Nations voice. There shall be a First Nations voice. The First Nations voice shall present its views to Parliament and the Executive on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The Parliament shall, subject to this Constitution, have power to make laws with respect to the composition, functions, powers and procedures of the First Nations voice. A referendum question could be simply, do you approve an alteration of the Constitution that establishes a First Nations voice? The other part of your question is, will this only be advisory? That's a bit of a um, loaded question in some ways. In Australia, there is our, our political system is parliamentary supremacy, right? Like most democracies, um, there's parliamentary supremacy. So the only um, body, representative body that makes laws in the country is the parliament. There's no other organisation, not even the High Court, that just keeps it in line with the constitution, that can, that can um, tell the parliament what to do in regards to making laws for the people, right? Um, so it is a fact that the voice, the First Nations voice, will only be advisory to the Parliament. If you think about it this way, of course we would love that power, right? We would love to have the power of a third chamber to Parliament, which is what is the opposite of advisory to Parliament, right? What is the fear-mongering that the right have used, the IPA and those bastards? They have been saying that the Blackfellas are asking for a third chamber to Parliament. Why? Because they know it will not succeed. People will not vote. 97% of the population, you've got to remember that power dynamic, they will not vote to change the rule book of Australia um, to give us that power. What do we do? We take steps. The first thing we do in unionism, even as a working class, we're talking about politics, the formation of a Labour Party, is we build a representative body. Who knows what we go on after after that? But we have to build, remember in the talk, I was talking about being honest with ourselves about our, about our effectiveness right now.
So, will it be advisory as in, does that make it powerless though? Absolutely not. Are our unions powerless because we don't have the constitutional right to make the work, you know, the industrial laws of the country? No. Our power comes from our coherency, our collectivism, our structure, the accountability of leaders. We don't have accountability of leaders right now because every time we've built an effective voice as First Nations um, people, as I talked about in the history of struggle, they have destroyed it. That's why they destroyed ATSIC. A coherent voice destroyed. The AAPA in the 20s destroyed. The power, and the Conservatives know this, is in its collectivism and its guarantee to speak. There is power in the Constitution in that rule book um, and that is how it will be powerful. For example, we table our advice on something, right? Call it advice. And they say no, they ignore it. Right now we hit the streets for a little while, right? It's hard to get people turning up, you know, there's that pattern that I talked about. But imagine them saying no transparently like that and us being able to campaign like we never campaigned before. When I organised the rallies and all that around the joint, I wondered why, why don't we have protests on every, in every community, in every, um, you know, not just in the cities. Why don't we turn our back to Nigel Scullion at the time when I was thinking about this, when the bastard turns off on our country after cut, cutting hundreds of millions of dollars from services. We don't have that structure and that coherency and the um, accountability of our leaders. We're not electing our leaders um, politically. So that's how. And that's the answer to that question. Thanks. Um, any further questions? Hi, Thomas. Comrades, um, Michelle Myers from the Maritime Union. We may have Thomas has just a full declaration here. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, well, say something first and then ask a question. So what, what we're calling for now is, or you, what you're asking us to do here, is to put submissions into this process. Um, I personally, obviously, we're all really upset when Turnbull turned his back on this and rejected the order of statement, but the, the second rejection was, was when Ken White went on his tour around Australia and, and did what, you know, the combination of the, the people that all already did, you know what I mean? When you all came together in that process, he decided to go on a road trip and make his own decision and do this co-design process. So, this, the simple thing, and it, it is a simple thing we can do now, it's not signing a petition and it's not doing a template email your MP bullshit thing that we do every day on every issue. Um, there's people in this room, and I know all of you, there's a lot of you that love to write stories. Um, we can do this, and we need to do this. We need to, I've written a submission, I'm a terrible writer, I'm absolutely awful. It makes us send it to Thomas to see what he thinks. But I have written what I think to this process. Um, and it's as simple as a one pager to say, you know, that what I think as a person that is trying to walk alongside the people that were over the that asked us to walk alongside them. Um, if everyone in this room wrote their own and their own story as to why uh, they think that we should be supporting the law statement and the voice to parliament enshrined in the constitution, and it's the only way that's going to work, um, I think we could make a really big impact just from this room itself. But Yesterday was the, well, on the weekend was the anniversary of the, the apology to the stolen generation. There was a lot of speeches in Parliament. I sat and listened, I had headphones in, listened to the Senate for a very long time. I heard Pat Dodson, I heard Linda Verdi in the House, and I heard uh, Penny Wong. And then I heard Lydia Paul, who completely rejected the call for the voice of the Parliament in the Constitution. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and why that um, approach from her is not what happened at Uluru and, and not what the, um, the essence of the order statement was, please. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Michelle. Um, we're not a homogenous people, you know, we've got our differing views like any, um, like any human beings, any group of human beings. Um, it was three days at Uluru and on the second day of, um, of those three, uh, around seven delegates of over 200 walked out um, because they had a different opinion to everyone else. Um, they said that they weren't heard in there, which, you know, was bullshit, um, but that's okay, you know, because what we do in political situations, we know this, right, comrades, we try and leverage our position. Um, you know, we try and create leverage to, um, to further our interests. Um, so, you know, I don't begrudge them for that, you know, that's political, you know, toing and froing. Um, 
and so she has continued to oppose it. There's a great irony in, in that, though. Um, one of the reasons why um, the opposition was there was the, um, that some people say, um, we think that our sovereignty will be undermined uh, or ceded by having um, constitutional recognition. Um, the irony that I was talking about was that Lydia thought then and when, uh, swore an oath to the Crown. Um, but the, and, I, and I can respond to that, um, that, uh, that view, actually. Um, firstly, our sovereignty is in our blood, it's in the soil, and it's in the way that we fight for our rights in our country. It's the way we protect our country. It's not something that can be undone by any white-collar document, not even the Constitution. If the Constitution in 1901 said that there are no longer any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country, would that have made a difference to who we are, to our sovereignty? Would it have stopped us from fighting the way that we did for our rightful place in this, in, on our country? No, it wouldn't have. 1967 counted us as full Australian citizens. Did we suddenly disappear as Kurrarig and Kalbagal people? No. You look at other First Nations in Canada, recognition, constitutional recognition. Did they disappear from the face of the earth? No, because it is in our blood, in the soil, and the way we fight for our country. If anything, constitutional recognition, empowerment, has, has furthered their interests, has empowered them. Because how are you going to um, face uh, the, the parliament, the, the decision makers in this country, if they don't even recognise who you are as First Nations? They don't even recognise that we exist. Um, so I'm not afraid of losing my sovereignty um, over constitutional recognition. I can see it as powerful that we put our representatives in the rule book so that they can speak unapologetically and also so that they're accountable to us. Um, I see a question um, back here. My name is Teresa Monta. I come from out of La Perouse community and um, I met with you a while back at Red Fern, so um, I come along here to hear firsthand because, um, and then I have to explain, um, Lydia Thorpe and I, we come from the same ancestor in Victoria and I have a bit of understanding um, because, like you say, from my perspective just to throw in, is we're, we're actually in Sydney, right, so my community's out there at La Perouse and um, there's a situation that I've experienced just fairly recently where I was supporting our other top pair I didn't see here because he's um, been called into a, a court to answer for putting a, a, that was a primary record on the government of Bonds monument. So because our families were fighting the British with the Dharma and Gamangara, because that's what's basically out of La Perouse, is the remnants of the first Sydney people, the Gamangara, the Dharma, or the Yuan, this is their east coast, then um, I went along to support um, Stephen. But the, what I wanted to share with you is um, there's a disconnect, there's some sort of disconnect, and I just wanted to try to make this example is like I applied myself, right, in my community for funding through the City of Sydney COVID grants. I've got COVID grants here. And um, I had got it in, there was a quick turnaround for it because we've been working, because the community I come from in 1988 is where the first big mass action happened here in Sydney, right? And out there in La Perouse, there are only 28 houses out there. And when in the winter, there's no one else there, it's good, but in other places, they're overrun by people because, you know, it's a, a big, um, Beach. It's, a, it's a tourist spot. Many people come from all over the world and stuff. So, but, but basically, we are living in, a, in, a, in the biggest city in Australia. Yeah. So our tenure or our uh, ability to stay here, like for us, um, is being difficult. So the ancestry that the families have out there, they descend from the man who owns the shield and the spears that Captain Cook took. Um, my grandfather, his name was Thomas Sims, he was one of 18 people who was down at the boat shed in the 1800s. 
when they were moved away from George Thornton and um, Henry Parks. So, since 1988, I was 20, right, and I saw the big mass action. And a nice room might fill up here. Never seen anything like it, because we, can, I can speak right, because we were shitting ourselves out there, right? Yeah. We knew that the big ships were coming from over there. And we thought they were going to come because people had passed away on the way. And we're sitting there and it's ears in my stomach. And then all of a sudden, all these buses turned up. They turned up from every point of the compass. And the feeling that happened when they got there. I saw the power of the people, and we've been trying to keep that old history alive because it is, is our right, isn't it, to tell that story. It's, it informs who we are, and we hold that story for the rest of all the people that come. But you think that we can get a go? You think we can get support? No. To this day, not even five said from anybody, I'm applying for funding for a play because in 1994, um, coming out of the Royal Commission into Deaths and Custody, and the Stolen Generations Report, the Sorry Report, we decided we would create a project informed from our own self that would create a unity in a community that fights. The two all the families still fight with them and they die twice, but we need this point of unity. So in 1988, the armies normally, they dropped everything. They got asked the question, where are you going to be tomorrow on the 26th of January? Um, this batch and said, I'll be up on the hill. This other batch said, I'll be up on the hill. You know how hard one that day was? And we went down up, mucked up because people had travelled, passed away on the way and everything like that. Our community needs to have a voice. We need your support to raise our voice, to tell our story, apply for that funding for the COVID grant. Now I got told that um, I'm ineligible, or we're ineligible, we are, because also I'm an elected representative for a Navy title that goes from Bundina, which is in Sutherland, on the other side of Bobby Bay, to Eden, which is almost to the Victorian border. There are 26 lands councils underneath us, and there is a white elephant, uh, not a white elephant, an uh, invisible elephant, or whatever you call it in the room, you know, because of the issue that we have to sort amongst ourselves about how the people were relocated. So once we get all that sorted, and this project that we've got, which is telling the story of my area, yeah, but they, they knocked us out, they said, you can't prove that you'll be doing anything in the inner city in 2021. But I was standing up defending him because he put something that was a primary record on Governor Quarry who ordered extermination against our people who are still living out there at Lafayette and we get told over and over again, Thomas, that could you please apply again somebody else, Leah Purcell, she's a beautiful person. I'm not saying they're not beautiful, but we are real living people. We need our own voice, we need to be supported, to have our play, to finish our cultural fishing event, to have the media come out there, not everywhere else. It is not right for us to let people speak over the top of our dead, over the top of our elders. It's only a respectful way to do it is to give the grassroots people in Sydney, so we have a bit of a focus, but you know what? So, you know NADOC? The NAIDOC event. The first NAIDOC is in 1957, and my grandfather, his name is Jack Sims, he was the descendant of the man that was down in that boat shed. Guess what? He was the vice chair of that, with Uncle Bert Grayson and Pearl Gibbs. And who are we? You know, we got told unceremoniously by people that were there, which doesn't help the unity that we need to build. Thanks for that. We got a very, very good Yeah, we got a very whatever problems that we got with one another and find a point of unity. And that's the only reason why I'm trying to explain to you what the reality is that's happening here. We need help to make that unity because I believe that community can help. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you later about how we could probably help the MUA, certainly. Um, but, you know, this is one of the things that drive me as well, you know. Travelled the country all over the place about, and, and hear similar stories. Even with native title, you know, like, um, and how it's too weak. You know, that we don't even have the right to veto our land getting dug up and destroyed. Um, and I, I, it, I wonder how do we improve this situation? Because at the end of the day, it's legislation, right? And, and it's the unaccountability of leaders not listening to your community. Um, and it's the unaccountability of people like um, 
Nigel Scullion before and, and now Ken Wyatt, the, the IAS money, you know, all of that royalty money that's there, that Scullion was giving to the Fishermen's Association for crying out loud, you know, and actually put money, indigenous money, towards the fight against a native title claim. If they're acts of parliament, then they, they must be able to change. So we should be able to unite, as you're saying, and campaign against these things more effectively. Um, I see Brother Bruce Trueworth there. Brother, thanks for coming, eh? And, um, and doing wonderful work in fighting for water rights. Um, I've been yarning with the mob up north, Newcastle Way, um, and, and the, the rank and file uh, members there want to get more behind this stuff. And we had a yarn with Owen Craigie and that. Um, and again, you know, it boils down to legislation that lets these companies and these politicians get away with outright corruption. Where's our more, of, you know, where's our national campaign? Um, fracking, you know, fracking on country. We're fighting fracking in, in the Northern Territory. It's happening, uh, you know, the fight is in WA as well. And um, underneath the Warrenora River too. Yeah, all over the joint. And so when I think about the voice and the, 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 the urgent need to establish this constitutional right to a, to a voice, I'm, I'm thinking about unity like Arnie's talking about there that our First Nations come together and in solidarity with each other make an absolute certain, you know, through a proper process, not just Facebook activism, but an official stand with the La Peru mob on those issues, you know, or with the Northern Territory mob on fracking. I think it'll be a powerful thing. Any further questions? Hi Thomas, my name is Eingrid. I'm actually a fellow Territorian as well, so I've only been here for a couple of years and still very much feel like a foreigner. But I just want to start off by saying thank you very much for your very public support um, for asylum seekers, um, and especially over the last couple of weeks with the Darwin 15. Um, I've been able to watch from afar um, all the great mobilisation that's happened in Darwin, and particularly with that, all our union comrades, and I remember when I was in Darwin 18 months ago, and, and Nades and Priya, when they were trying to deport them back then, um, it was really great to have the support of, of all the union's colleagues to come out. They were the first ones to come out there first thing in the morning, and unfortunately weren't able to stop them getting them to Christmas Island, but we, you know, we still tried our best. Um, on that very note, I want to sort of talk about you know, asylum seekers, refugees, migrants to Australia. Um, you know, after that, our First Nations people, they're potentially the, arguably the most marginalised here in, in Australia. Um, and I think that comes from this subversive racism that still pervades our society. I think multiculturalism is this great myth uh, in Australia. Um, you know, maybe in places like Darwin, where we're getting closer to that. But when I, when I came to Sydney and I see this place is full of ghettos. We've got ghettos in North Sydney, we've got ghettos in, in Manly, in Cronulla. You know, they're the ghettos we probably don't get, you know, people don't refer to as ghettos, but these subcultures, these pockets of people from monocultures, you know, living together. Um, and it's like, I, I want to ask the question, you know, as a, a migrant as well to Australia, um, what can we do more um, to bring, you know, these communities together, you know? Um, I feel fortunate, uh, I guess, um, through my work to have spoken to, you know, thousands of Aboriginal people you know, over the years and, and hear about their lived experience. But I think so many Australians, and particularly those maybe who have come from overseas as well, don't have a genuine appreciation for this history, what the current lived experience of Indigenous people are in Australia. And if anything, we should be, you know, the greatest of allies in our, in our struggles together. And especially, you know, people seeking asylum, they have a, a, a shared history in terms of the struggles that they may have gone through in their own countries against colonial powers. So what can we do more to bring these communities together to, to defeat this racism that still exists in Australia, which I think is, you know, one of the biggest barriers to, you know, this constitutional voice, you know, this voice to Parliament being established for our First Nations people. Thanks. You know, I think our, I think our communities will always, you know, tend to stick together as, as humans do, you know, with like people and, and all the rest. Um, and I think, you uh, I think it's there's, there's already you know a lot of good interaction as far as uh, but I think uh, the the biggest 
the, the, the first thing is don't friggin' indefinitely detain human beings, right? Like, far out, man. Like, it's just disgusting. It's just, we should be uh, ashamed of ourselves as Australians. I don't know what the, the, you know, the ultimate answer to your questions are, mate, but I think we've just got to keep fighting, keep organising, um, uh, and, and, yeah, just keep turning people out. Sorry, mate, I'm a bit lost on that. But, you know, I mean, that's why we're, we're turning up in Darwin. Um, uh, you know, one of the, the ways that they've managed to um, uh, slow down our fight for social justice in this country is by attacking unions because we've been at the forefront all, of all of those struggles. Um, yeah. Thanks, mate. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Uh, Henry Rajendra, Deputy President of the Teachers' Federation. Um, uh, thank you so much for all that you do and for tonight. Um, and I certainly uh, think that it's not incumbent on you to have the answers uh, to define the struggle, certainly to define what we need. Um, but I'll take that previous point of question and assist um, uh, that we, as public school and TAFE teachers, have an incredible responsibility to this cause on two levels. And it is framed around education. Firstly, I, I assume that you would agree that um, to, to achieve what we need to achieve here collectively is about a community campaign. And education is absolutely critical. And what you've done today, whether we're all coming at different levels into this, education has been critical of what you've done today. So you talk about ATUI, the, the training that's available, the way that we can take back our messages and frame it in more of a structured way with our own organisations around people is critical. But can I fess up something about the education system, particularly in New South Wales? And, uh, and I think it's important to identify the problem we have a public school system. Um, in part, we have a TAFE system as well, where it's defined, in, by, by and large, by the gaps between the advantage and disadvantage. Structurally, we have a system in place where there is an incredible gap between the student achievement between Indigenous and non-Indigenous students in this state. I offer this as a commitment on behalf of our union. We declared our support for the Uluru Statement back in 2018 at our, um, our February Council, March Council and Annual Conference. But we did something of, of more substance in 2019. And we said that we want everything that the Uluru Statement calls for, the ambitions, the, 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 the points it makes. But we said the way that we can contribute to that, and this is our promise, and I guess this is a reach out to everyone else in your own respective organisations, search within what you could do better within that. What we've identified is that if we realise all our policies, whether it's funding, whether it's staffing, whether it's actual deliberate programs to, to bring our Aboriginal students closer to a full curriculum and ultimate success and high standards, that's our responsibility. So on behalf of the teaching profession across our TAFE colleges and our schools, our public schools, that's our solemn promise. And I'll be very clear, that's the policy of the Teachers' Federation. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your unwavering solidarity made over the years. It's been really important. I, I, I don't know if you've heard this story, but early in the campaign in uh, early 2018, we had the Uluru Statement up in, in Brisbane. And uh, this, this boy walking with his family, he was only about nine year old, pulls him up and drags him over and says, that's the Uluru Statement from the heart, and then told them about it. And it was because a teacher somewhere had actually not waited for it to be curriculum or anything like that, taught the, the students, and then that boy taught his family about it. Um, you know, a really important place in this campaign um, that teachers have. Actually, the, the answer to the question earlier, one of the answers, um, is that, you know, if you can imagine if First Nations have this guaranteed right to have a voice in the, in the centre of decision making in Australia, I'm very confident that we'd be saying that this is not good enough the way that we treat people that it's disgusting, that it's not in line with our culture um, and our beliefs. And it goes for climate change as well. You know, when there's a voice in the centre of decision making in this country, constitutional right for a voice, that also gives a voice to the, to the, the waters and the land, you know, the mountains and the, and the flora and the fauna, um, because we speak for country.
say Australia's bloody lucky to have got me. <laughs> <laughs> but I also think to what the gentleman from the Teach Federation said, because I did my thesis years ago without the rules, about for which I had first class honours, I might say, uh, the social relationship of European and Aboriginal children at the school in Latin. And I've got to say, all those years ago, the teachers there were doing a jolly good job because there was very little racism among children. They need to do the work. So it is possible to do it. And there are other teachers in this room that ought to be making sure it's done in the school that they need to. Trouble is, Action show, and I meet a lot of Aboriginal people who have a lot of the answers for us, especially about forest management, fire management, water management, and they're just raring to go. You know, books have been written about it, and a lot of them are really, you know, very visionary and we're, you know, have taking it to scale practices, cultural practices, but they're hog tied because it's uh, all on private land, public forests, or national forests aren't used. What? I love that idea of the Makarata Commission. If the Makarata Commission existed, how would it help with that sort of climate action? I think the Makarata Commission would help with uh, climate action in, in truth telling, I think, um, firstly. You know, the truth that you said, that there's this great um, knowledge and, um, and that's important to how countries looked after, you know, how our waterways are looked after and all the rest. Um, I think it, it still comes to, um, well then there's agreement making, so it supports agreement making. Um, power, you know, I mean, everything comes back to power, right? Yeah. Um, the power for First Nations people to do what we, um, are, you know, are born to do um, in the line of our ancestors and look after our country. Um, if we have power over our own destiny, um, as the Uluru Statement says, then um, this country is going to benefit from it as well as climate and so much else. It's always the beginning place, right? Yeah. Um, I was, I'm Monica Crouching from the Independent Education Union. Um, we represent the teachers and support staff in non-government schools. Um, and although our teachers are probably a bit more conservative than those that the teachers fed, there are still plenty of them, especially among the Catholics, who um, are very supportive of the Uluru Statement and the voice to Parliament. Um, so my question is, I mean, I've got a few really, but what more can teachers do? Um, what, what would you like to see the union movement as a whole do to progress the voice to Parliament? Do we need a Labor government to progress it? Do you have any faith in a Labor yes, government do. progressing it? And um, yeah, I guess maybe that maybe that's enough questions. And also, I'd just like to say um, I've been very moved every time I've read the Uluru statement. But to hear you recite it was something else. So thank you very much. So I think uh, the greatest guarantee that we have of going to a referendum is to make sure that the Liberals are kicked out of government and Labor wins, because they have uh, it's it's their platform. Um, to take it to a referendum in the first term. Uh, since 2019, the, the conference in uh, Adelaide in 2019, solid platform. And they remain solid, but any members of the Labor Party or affiliated unions need to keep it in their ears so they maintain um, that stance, because you can never take it for granted. Um, in regards to what more teachers can do, another couple of ideas. Um, I, I remember when Scott Morrison, we all know he's full of shit, but he had a letter from a, 
a, a, a child and he said, I always listen to students, why not get as many classrooms as possible to send a, a letter to the Prime Minister saying, you know, we want, um, here's our submission. Send, send it to the advisory group and say, here's our submission, the, the, the public consultation process. <laughs> no, I'm serious. The yeah. they, they try to stifle us. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll put it by the, the parents and, you know, yeah. most so probably you know. parents. Who, and just by putting it by the parents, they'll learn something, right? And in our, in our campaign research, there's this strong correlation between those that say in polling that they'll vote yes to a referendum, uh, between that and those that say that they have heard about the statement. So just learning about it um, is growing this movement, which it has done um, for three years. Yep. Another question there? I think we're good. Hi, Thomas. My name is Sasha. Um, I work at New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association, before that at Unity New South Wales. Thanks so much for tonight. It's been um, really moving. Um, I just wanted to ask a bit more detail on Obviously, the focus now is to get those submissions in by the 31st of March to really provide overwhelming support for recognising the voice in the Constitution. What's the strategy beyond that, and what steps will occur after the submissions close? Yeah, great question. So we need to continue to educate more people about what it is, as I said, that correlates. Um, with, the, if, um, with the masses of submissions that go in, that'll build a narrative to you know, to continue to, to fight for what we're calling for. The, the fear is that the wedge that the um, coalition will use is to move to legislate it quickly. Labor fears that as well because it's, you know, it'll be a difficult thing to say no to. We're saying to them, you know, you need to hold the ground because if it is just legislated, if, if it's before a referendum, then it's setting it up to fail. As we know, all those voices being silenced and destroyed will happen again might not be in our generation, but it might be the next. Um, and the reason for that is, if it is legislated and exists, it won't go to a referendum because it already exists. You'll lose momentum. Secondly, it will, if it does its job and it speaks unapologetically on behalf of its people, it's going to upset um, some of those that are comfortable in the status quo and then make it harder for a referendum to succeed. Thirdly, um, all New organisations, even old organisations, have problems from time to time. Certainly new ones have teething problems, you know. Um, so anything like that will be used against us, just like at, um, how it was used against ATSIC. You know, it wasn't around for that long. Um, you know, we're still finding its feet, really, especially given that people were coming from a place of such um, poverty and, um, you know, in them days, closer to, um, you know, the white Australia policy and all those things. So, yeah, that's... Um, um, and I've got to say as well, something I haven't said is we, you know, for Mob in the Room, La Peru, you know, um, Bruce, we, we're calling on all Australians to make a submission about the, you know, the, the three key things, you know, and you'll see that on the website. But what's going missing here is, and this is a real shit process that they're running, I talked about how short the, the public consultation is. But they're not given time for MOB to say how they want this voice designed and how it should be representative. They're talking about, um, I think it's 18 representatives, two from each state and two from the Torres Strait. But that doesn't take into account our language groups, our song lines, um, you know, the different impacts of colonisations region by region. Um, so there's great flaws and we need to be, um, you know, we need to be having a say about that in the It's an excellent point, and it goes to that first question. Sorry, I've got to be here, right? Yeah. 
it sort of goes to your question as well, Peter. The way we're, we're proposing to do it, some of the pushback early days was um, that, and, and this came out in the Joint Select Committee report late 2018, was that um, people asked, what does the voice look like? You know, what are we voting for here in a referendum? Um, and so that recommended that this co-design process to put some meat on the bone, so to speak, right? What we're proposing is that there is a draft exposure bill with the, wherever the, the, the design lands for the voice, right? How it's representative, what regions, what the regions are, and all that. This draft exposure bill would not be passed through Parliament. Um, it would be there along with the referendum bill that does get passed. The referendum happens and people can see. There is the bill ready to be passed through Parliament and we know exactly what we're voting for. The detail, just in case people are confused about this, the detail of the design is never going to go into the Constitution because that would never succeed, you know. The, the Constitutional Amendment, as I showed earlier, would be really simple um, and it would be enabling um, the voice not, you know, it's like the Constitution works for other you know, like the High Court and that, there's, there's legislation on the, the detail. That's because that legislation uh, would need to evolve with the needs of the people, right? It would need to improve. You can't enshrine that and have it set in concrete. I hope that explains those things all right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas, for your talk tonight. It's been very informative. Um, what do you think can First Nations people do that they're not doing now to enable a more ready acceptance of the statement from the heart? Well, that's, um, I don't know. I think we're doing everything that we can. Um, the government dismissed this outright in 2017. There's been no resources for this campaign. The, you know, the MUA, our unions, the Teachers Federation, um, you know, people like Arnie Pat Anderson, um, you know, with her time and resources and Professor Megan Davis and, and many others, Teela Reid from this area, um, just doing everything we can. Um, I think... What about more consensus building within the community? Uh, well, that takes money and time, right? It, it does, you know, like, the... We need to remember, though, with the, with the process that led to Uluru, that was a bloody big fight just to get back, right? So that didn't come out about without struggle. That bastard like Tony, uh, Tony Abbott was a Prime Minister at the time, didn't just say, oh, we should have uh, a, cons a, you know, uh, a dialogue process around the country for black fellas. He didn't decide that without us putting pressure on. Um, that came through struggle. Um, because it takes a lot of money and time, it takes a lot of money to be able to take something to the people like that. So, yeah, I mean, this sort of thing, um, talking in communities as I've done, is how we get that message out there and do it, yeah. Sorry, mate. You are doing your bit of this. Yeah, yeah, and I ask, always asking others to, to get on board and do their bit. You know, because there's misinformation and we need to break through that too. There's no further question. The opposite of hope is just doing nothing, right? Because you, you don't think that you can win. Um, I think we can win. What I learned in the union movement is you organise to win. You know, you don't just expect it to land on your lap. And, um, you know, and certainly the pricks that are in charge and very comfortable aren't going to do it for us. Um, so I have great hope. What gives me hope is that I know that this is right. I've been involved in the protests for many years, organising, and I don't see us being effective enough, and I see this as a very effective way for us to better organise. Um, I see us, I have hope because I think this is the unity that was talked about um, by Sister over there. You know, you have to build structure, you have to have the resources to do it, like the question just before you. How do we take things to the people? Well, you've got to build the structure and have the resources to take things to the people. You've got to have the representation that can go after the resources required in an effective way. Um, and that's why I have hope. I have hope that we will do this. It's just a matter of time. The children that you're teaching as teachers, you know, um, they give us great hope. Um, they're not 
they're not getting the same prejudice in built into them as uh, you know the generations my generation did, um, and they will do this because um, because of that. And uh, but we can't wait for them to do it because it's another generation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, that are going to be incarcerated um, disproportionately and all the rest. So thank you everybody for. Listening.